This is an industrial dispute, Filipino style. These girls are striking for higher wages, but it's Christmas time and they're having fun. That's typical of the Philippines. We do take our problems with a lot of gaiety, but the problems are no less real for all that. And behind the gaiety, there lies violence. This happy little picket line was later broken up by military and police, as you will hear. I'm Jose Diokno, a lawyer and a Filipino. I'd like to tell you something about my country, and that way, about other third world countries, because our problems are very much alike. Most of all, I'd like to tell you about my people. We're almost 50 million in all, an island people living in about 7,000 islands between the Pacific and the China Sea. More than half of my people are below 20 years of age. Most of us speak English of a sort, and we have about oh, more students in the university than Britain. Our land is beautiful and rich. We have all the resources we need except oil. Yet most of my people are poor and suffer hardship and oppression. How we were thrown into that situation and what we're trying to do to get out of it, some using reason, others using guns, that's what I'd like to tell you about. My family and I live in Manila. My wife and I have 10 children and 8 grandchildren. Often on Sundays, we all get together for lunch. My home is also my office. I lead a group of lawyers who've acquired a reputation for helping people in trouble with the authorities, whom other lawyers are reluctant to help. So people come to see me day and night. These girls are a delegation from those you saw on strike at the beginning of the program. Some were arrested and they have come for advice. After you went on strike, what countermeasures did the management do? The management issues uh, uh, some advertisement that we are uh, illegal strikers and then uh, they even uh, uh, go to the policemen, to the military and to the judges, to municipal judges uh, to issue warrant of arrest, injunctions, even though uh, no preliminary investigation had been made with regards to the strike. Well, were any warrants of arrest issued against any of your members? Uh, yes, uh, 17 officers of the union uh, were issued warrant of arrest and two were arrested. The case of these girls is typical of what's happening in this country with uh, our workers. And see on the supernatural. We believe our own efforts cannot be enough. We seek God's help because we've been made to believe we can't help ourselves. And religion in the past contributed to our sense of powerlessness. The church is changing now, but much of the sense of powerlessness remains. And since this makes many of us seek a father on earth as we do in heaven, this makes it easy for government to be authoritarian, to manipulate and to mislead, like the present government of my country. Ferdinand E. Marcos has been president since 1965. He claims that from a situation of anarchy, he has built a new, peaceful and prosperous society. Now what do we have? We have a government that has been able to do away with uh, 200 private armies, uh, immobilized 250 syndicated uh, gangsters, uh, uh, and uh, we have uh, been able to um, uh, quell a uh, uh, leftist, rightist, or communist, rightist, uh, a rebellion that threatened to take over the government uh, and uh, was about to when the martial law was proclaimed the um, most important the most far-reaching and from my point of view uh, the uh, key change in the entire uh, 
um, listing of uh, reforms and alterations in our economic, social, and political life would be uh, the uh, internal change in our people, the changes in their attitude, their uh, um, thoughts, and their uh, uh, heart and spirit. Uh, from bankruptcy, we have uh, developed into a viable economy. We increased the uh, minimum wage by more than 50%. So, um, by and large, the um, wage earner uh, it takes home much more now than he did. Mr. Marcos is right. For the small segment of our population who have jobs in the modern sector, they get some spin-offs from the westernized facade of our economy. But at the same time, we have tremendous unemployment, about 25%. What economic development there has been has deliberately favored multinationals who come here to take advantage of our cheap, highly skilled labor, workers who have also been cowed into docility. Production has grown, but it has favored only a few of the people and Mr. Marcos has had to borrow vast sums to set up the infrastructure that multinationals need. Today we have a foreign debt of about 16 billion dollars, eight times what it was 10 years ago. So the method of development, unfortunately egged on by financial institutions, world financial institutions, has been a method of development that is concentrated on simply making the economy grow and not concerned with what is really being produced and, or how it is being distributed. So you have a situation where a lot of our resources and skills are being used to supply the needs of foreign markets and the wants of the elite. And we do have rich families and elite. This is a display of expensive imported watches. There are people here who can consider spending a quarter of a million US dollars on a watch in a developing country that's obscene. Our elite gained access to their world of privilege, as elites always have, by being close to government whether that government was Spanish, American, or as now, the Marcos family. Their ostentation creates great social tension because they do not invest their money in ways that could develop our economy or create new jobs. The elite have chosen to live behind heavily guarded walls, either because they're afraid of the people or unwilling to mix with them. Cardinal Sin, Archbishop of Manila, also questions President Marcos's priorities. Uh, I would say that the priorities were not well planned. It could have been first the essential needs of the people, and then we go continuously up and up in order that the the most uh, the most uh, not really so important thing could be done later. But what happened is that. We started to build big hotels, big uh, centers, telling the whole world that we are already countries of the bellum. And pride entered, and vain glory entered. And so we made our people a victim because of image building. Image building. Far too much time and effort goes into image building of one kind or another. A very pleasant good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Rita Gadi Baltazar once again at the reception hall of the Philippine International Convention Center. This afternoon, Madame Imelda Romualdez Marcos and the Honorable Mayor of the City of Jeddah will be signing an agreement declaring the Jeddah Metro Manila Sister City Relationship.
This is Mrs. Imelda Marcos, the President's wife, First Lady, Governor of Metro Manila, and Minister of Human Settlements. Today's image is Madame Marcos, Ambassador of International Goodwill. All part of a continuing ritual of political occasions by which the Marcos family tried to establish a personal dynasty. We are all planning for man. Man as individual and man in community. With man as the center and anchor of all our efforts and affection. This union of Jeddah and Metro Manila, perhaps this can be a beginning of a world order and peace and tranquility for humanity. The Marcoses seem to live in two worlds at once, the world of hard politics and a dream world where the harsh realities of our people's lives hardly exist. Image building is part of a personalized style of politics far removed from any kind of representative democracy. The Marcoses see themselves as fairy godparents, offering from the goodness of their hearts all good things to the people. The Children's Hospital was Mrs. Marcos's personal contribution to the International Year of the Child. She calls it a wonderland, and it is. But it's the kind of fantasy we can't afford yet. Hello. How are you? As a nation, we need first mass health care and mass preventative medicine. Our children in the countryside have almost no medical care. That's where the money should have been spent. It's a delightful and very efficient hospital with a highly trained and devoted staff. But it has cost millions and we don't have the money to run it at full occupancy. This magnificent heart hospital, more image building, was Mrs. Marcos's gift of love to Asia on St. Valentine's Day. It's a sophisticated medical unit, but our main killers are dysentery, gastroenteritis, and tuberculosis. And these are better fought with clean water and sewage systems, and above all, with better food. In the Philippines, it's the simple diseases that kill. We need to control whooping cough and pneumonia before we move into the higher realms of heart surgery. She wanted to build a very, very beautiful basilica, even bigger than the Basilica of St. Peter in Rome. And uh, each businessman were told to contribute and five million, and if they die, they will be buried there. So it will be a basilica of the rich people. She would call that Basilica of the Infant Jesus. I am so afraid because I believe that it is a crime to have this kind of Basilica for the honor and glory of God and our people are hungry. So I told him first, I told her first, to use the money for shelter, for hospitals, and for the poor. And Mrs. Marcos did it her way, but the people can't afford the houses she's built. That's something the commentator of the government television channel won't tell you. Stand by studio, please. And here we have gathered uh, the residents from the Tatalon area. You will recall that about a year ago, this area was awarded to them by the president. And today we have the housing units already established by the National Housing Authority and the Ministry of Human Settlements. Um, as the names of 10 representatives are being called on stage to receive from Mrs. Marcos the title of the land, 
about a year ago when President Marcos visited this area, the people were practically in tears. And they couldn't believe the fact that uh, after having stayed here for so long, they would, in effect, finally own the piece of land where they have squatted over the past so many years. This is a song by the school children residing here at the Tatalon Estate, expressing their gratitude to the First Lady and the other officials of the National Housing Authority and the Ministry of Human Settlements, speaking about the new tomorrow that they face and the gratitude that they feel for the government's concern for them, together with the school buildings that have been constructed. The children were taught to sing that song for today image building again and again all good things are shown to come from above not as a result of the efforts of the people and behind the fronts newly painted for the occasion the buildings are still improvised shacks many development projects are like this all show no substance yet the people pay who is fooling whom This is the reality which official television never showed. People forced to live in sewage pipes. They live in these pipes not because they want to but because they have to. There just isn't anywhere else for them to go. They have been forced into this place and into other slums because there is no work for them in the countryside. And when they come to the cities, there is often still no work and no housing that they can afford. One third of the people in Manila live in slums like these, without clean water or sanitation. No wonder dysentery is the fourth cause of death in the country. This gentleman has been living in this tube since August of this year. He was relocated uh, about April of this year to a rather far off place, about uh, a little about 60, 70 kilometers from Manila. But he has no job there. So he has to come back here because otherwise he couldn't feed his family. Here, he does sell fried bananas. He has organized a small cooperative here of different uh, people who live in the area and they've, uh, they're, they fry bananas and that's what they make a living from. You can get an idea from this about how much malnutrition, how much hunger, how much disease there is in this area. <laughs> But even here, human dignity cannot be completely stifled. And I think that uh, from here, uh, I'll take you down to one of the clinics which has been set up by the people themselves. And this is just one of the many examples of what people are doing in an effort to assert that they are people. This simple clinic in someone's front room looks after more children in a year than ever get to see the fantasy of the children's hospital on the other side of town. This is what we should have more of, preventative care. One doctor, Mita Pardo de Tavera, has helped volunteer health workers and mothers run their own clinic. This child is three years old, but she has the weight of a one-year-old child. We can consider her as a third-degree uh, malnutrition, which uh, is more or less uh, the picture of children in the country today, where 80% where of children below five years of age are malnourished, and 5% have third-degree malnutrition. Actually, what we need uh, are uh, services that reach people when you consider that two-thirds of children are born at home and that the country is made up of 7,000 islands. Not everybody can come to Manila where all the uh, uh, tertiary health care hospitals are found. But out in the rural areas, there's practically nothing. 
Now, it is true that we have uh, magnificent hospitals like the Heart Center, but that has absorbed a great portion, more, more than 50% of the, of the money for health. 72% um, of Filipinos, or 7 out of 10, have never even seen a doctor. Interval fights stress by releasing energy, fights stress by increasing body resistance. Interval. Why should human beings accept conditions like these? Why isn't there more protest? Because as soon as people do protest, they are called subversive, and the army or the paramilitary move in and start arresting them and sometimes killing them. We have a huge army, nearly 300,000 strong. Ten years ago, they were only 60,000. Then, President Marcos declared martial law, and the army grew and grew. Since we don't have any foreign enemies, the army is used to control us. Ironic, isn't it? Legitimate social protest has become a crime. Intimidation, often brutal, follows. Some fishermen and their families lost their livelihood and their homes when they were moved to allow a Japanese company to build a fish processing plant. The people objected. A Protestant deaconess, Sister Miling, led them. She was arrested as a subversive. It was January 27, uh, 15, when we had a big convention in St. James uh, Academy here in Malabon. And 27, I was picked up already. I was only in pain, invited. They say it's only a confrontation. But I didn't really realize that's, that's the time. And what happened? Well, as they accused me as um, subversive, an enemy of my own country. I don't know. <laughs> what did they mean by subversive? I don't know about that. Did they call you a communist? They say that I'm fighting against the government. But God knows I'm not doing it. I'm just helping the people just to be a good Christian. I thought in that time... <laughs> We have a peaceful life in this country. We have a freedom to speak what we want. And so in after three days, my uncle had visited me in the prison club. And he died when he see me in this situation where I was kept with black spots and over my body. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been formally charged? No, no, it's until now. How long did they keep you? I was kept in the criminal cell together with the carnapper, kidnapper, killer, holdappers. I was kept there almost a six months, six months. And nobody could always help me in my worries. This is where Sister Miling was kept, right in the heart of Manila. The police who held and tortured her, and many others like her, are part of the military. If you have freedom, I tell you, you not be put in prison just talking for your rights. If there is freedom, if there is no political detainee in his own country, that's why I tell you that you cannot sing the song which you want to sing. I don't want to hurt anybody, but the only thing is I could see the human rights. Don't it's not here in my country. If you had no rights anymore, maybe it's better to die. I told the president to define what subversion means because his definition is not really correct. 
I said, your definition is that when we say something against you, we are already subversive. When in fact, we are helping you. There can be no real democracy when there is no opposition. And there is no opposition because we've had martial law for eight years. It was lifted last year in name, but continues in fact. Before that, we had had 70 years of democracy, but martial law destroyed all our democratic institutions. So people have no way of saying what they feel and what they want. Four times last year, the military fired upon a crowd of marchers protesting high prices and uh, military abuses, killing scores of people. So people have had to develop new ways of fighting for their rights. Protest has gone underground. Hidden presses put out news that newspapers don't want to print or don't dare to. The Communist Party conducts seminars in the slums. As it is all underground, moderates like me can't get into the debate. Government repression is increasingly polarizing discussion. You are either for Marcos and his government, or you are for the extreme left. Uh, in countries like the Philippines, uh, we can maintain the balance between authority and individual rights. Uh, without um, in any manner losing the concept of the Western Thai style democracy as known by Locke or Jefferson and others, uh, Montesquieu and the rest of them, uh, provided that, uh, however, the emergency powers are exercised properly. I was arrested when martial law was declared and, and, and was kept for about almost two years under detention without charges without even being interrogated. I was arrested, uh, told simply that, well, uh, they suspected me of being uh, wittingly or unwittingly a member of a conspiracy to overthrow the government, which is, of course, which was very, very silly. In any case, during my two years of detention, and especially during the one month that I spent in total solitary confinement, uh, I came to realize that if I didn't know why I had been detained, if I didn't know what were the rules governing the detention, because they, they were never told to me, if I could be detained this way without trial and without charges, what about all the other people? You know, there were about more than 70,000 people who have undergone the same experience as I have, and even worse. It was at that time that I decided that if I should ever get out, then I would see what I could do to help the people, and particularly those who were under detention. So when I did get out, I helped found a small group which we called the Free Legal Assistance Group with a very uh, appealing acronym, FLAG. And we started out simply by trying to represent political prisoners. But as we went along, we realized we couldn't stop there. We realized that a lot of people who were, had absolutely no political ideology to speak of, but who were simply fighting for their rights as human beings, little farmers, squatters, students, workers, they were all being detained simply because they were standing up for their rights. And something had to be done about this. We began to organize a kind of barefoot lawyer scheme using law students and community leaders to teach the poor their rights. The Philippine government has not only signed, it has ratified the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. But of course, we lawyers know that there is a wide difference between asserting rights and enforcing them. We may claim to have many rights, but how can we get these rights to be respected? Please don't ever confuse legal rights with justice. 
Therefore, as lawyers and as law students, our function is not only to cause respect for law, it is to improve law, to make law so that it will truly give us justice. No, no government can really re depend on force alone. If it continuously depends on force, then the day is going to come when its force is not going to be enough. So government tries to transform that force into law so that it favors the interests of those who have power. Well, in the same way, law can be used to fight that force. If law can be used to institutionalize social injustice and inequity, to exploitation and privilege, and to marginalize people and throw them into poverty, then people can also use law to get out of that situation. Once or twice, we have even been able to prosecute members of the military. Now, let me now go on to the um, incident in question. Is it not true that the battalion S2 is basically the intelligence officer of the battalion? Yes. And that would include not only the disposition of enemy forces, but even the disposition of friendly forces and the disposition of the civilian elements involved. Would that not be correct? Correct. Very good. In this now, instance, a battalion of soldiers S2, entered a village looking for rebels, then went on to rape, steal, and kill. We are prosecuting the colonel and the captain charged with two of the killings. By this, we hope to show our people that they can use law to enforce their rights. Unfortunately, such occasions are few and far between. In writing. With American assistance, the army has become very strong and powerful. Martial law gave the army vast new powers. Outside our cities, the military, to a large extent, are the government. So far, they have been amenable to civilian control. But more and more, they show signs of acting independently. Mr. Marcos gives them much leeway because he needs them. The kind of development he's pursuing is so oppressive that without a strong army and a ruthless one, he could not hope to carry it out. The strength of the army lies not only in what you see, but also in what you can't see. Behind these regular forces, there are paramilitary groups, often made up of army misfits who have been recycled under army officers into commando-type units. Supposedly, their job is to fight rebels, but actually, they're used to terrorize ordinary workers and farmers. By committing atrocities, the military can't do themselves for fear of prosecution. All this in the name of national security. For Marcos, it is his concept of national security. He identifies the national security with his own security. So he gives more money so that they will maintain him in power. You see now. So familiar has military suppression become, it has replaced fairy stories in some of our kindergartens and in the imagination of children. For some children, the brutality of the military is not a fairy tale. Marela, who's only eight years old, tells what happened when the soldiers came to her village. Mutang kam yan e mga anak ang bagaw. Tapos, to mamutang man si nanay na butang kan ju marwara ju markaro yag ng tangis. Tapos. Trapeño kami, tumba na lang kami, atulo. 
Tapos aku nakalara yakin nyo juga rin sang kaniya kamot. Tapos pagko aku nga maminyaw naman, umuhat aku. Tapos aku sinanay yung kulwan nga sa madan ulo. Tapos um, dinisini na naigot ikan si Jumar ang lawan sa liwan. Tapos asugarong ko anak ulo puro sila dugo. Astan utok na ka di ang kananay utok siya anak ulo. Tapos nagtinangis ng gan mamait ang bata. Ako kargahon. Tapos dadlagang kami kami nga lima. Puro kami kabataan. This boy watched from the safety of a coconut tree, soldiers questioning his father. Chatu, pag siring nga hinto, hinto ni tatay, pag pagkuan ng bintiw ni Rami, ngan gapuso ni Yaliwat, din ni, ngan timalag, gin, kuan ang gapos at andin ni, ngan ing katinan andin ni, ing katinan andin ni, gin katinan andin ni, ngan impalingi, ngan tagnus ni Rami, ngan Kau anu niya, gut-guton andin ni. Timahal tu. Ira pag inuyagan ang ulo, magkuarang kahoy ngan. Ira sipaon na itong punong lubi. Pag-abot nga tu, tahu ba nirahan daw ng lubi para diri kilalon. Ano naman yung magbubuha doon sa dunia na kuwan? Ano yung plano? Ano yung bukan yung tatay? Kay pag makabulos, manalimbasyo kay bisan pa man nga ni Chiu nga kuti pa nga ni. As always, violence breeds violence. Guerrilla forces are building up in the countryside. Throughout the Philippines, farmers are being pushed off the land. Here, for example, among the great mountain rice terraces, one of the wonders of the world, the government plans to build the biggest hydroelectric power plant in Asia. Four great dams will deprive 100,000 tribal farmers of their rice fields. This has given sophisticated political activists an opportunity to get the support of tribal people, here the Kalingas. These are warrior people. You earn your right to dance here by killing a man. If you feel strongly for your ancestral lands, as they do, if your dead are buried here, you hardly need encouragement to fight for what you know to be your rights. Nak, nama nama lawi kan misal na anaya silau. Man manuwe ka na nanaya ay kuma ng wata ko mangikwa ng sanaya kumpanador sa nanaya apit daga sa chika na kuma na katoy wata ko lumagwe ka na kay atuwan No, iwanan mi day toy awan ah, matay kan suga po na nga hangi ma yuyati ka Kagaya yung adam, kaya pa itata kaya mang mabalim mga itod biti kukuha mi nga daga. Kami nga itod. No, laydo namin ti gubir, no? Nga agawan dito ti daga mi, kabil dala yung ti gumba. Daita. The threat of their valley being flooded to provide power for the cities and for industry made the villagers only too willing to listen to the urgings of new friends. Now this village, like other villages all over the Philippines, harbors Filipino communists. They call themselves the New People's Army, part of the armed wing of an alliance of radical forces, mostly communist, called the National Democratic Front. For security reasons, most of them can't show their faces to the camera. One of them can. He is already well known to the authorities. He is a Catholic priest, Father Conrado Balweg. He is one of the most wanted men in the Philippines. 
Despairing of peaceful political change, Father Balweg has given up the ritual of the mass to be a guerrilla. I do not uh, uh, understand why people would be bothered you know, if a priest take up arms to uh, defend the life of people who are unjustly and violently killed day in and day out. I'm not saying the rituals of the mass every day. Because what I am doing now, being linked with the daily activities of the people in their struggle to liberate themselves from oppression and exploitation, that is the essence of the mass. And so, essentially, I am saying mass every day. And that is the highest point of the mass that you offer your life, you unite your life absolutely with the life of the people, not only for 30 minutes, but 24 hours a day, you are united with their life. And that is the reality of the mass. People should realize that violence had been there before. The armed struggle that we are taking now is just a necessary or a logical consequence of the existing unjust and violent system. The new people's army is teaching the people more than just how to fight. Again, we can't show their faces, but we can hear their voices. Americano. Burgis Comprador. Apot daga, landlord. We feel what is important first before uh, we teach any other thing. What is important is that they understand the political implications, uh, the political issues, uh, the politics of what's happening. Why are they poor? You know, who is exploiting them? Who is their enemy? Who are their friends? For example, the health problem is linked to our poverty. But why are we poor? When in spite of the richness of the Philippines, why are we poor? Most of them are illiterates. Some of them are grade two graduates. You probably noticed that uh, many of them are writing, taking down notes. So that education is happening. People keep saying, but don't you want development? Uh, the way I see it, the issue here is not development, but the issue here is exploitation. All the development projects that we have seen have not meant genuine development for these people, but have been a vehicle for getting more wealth out of their land. We know that we are waging a protracted war, a long war, and we are willing to wait until the day comes that we are able to liberate our country. We now have uh, 32 guerrilla fronts in 52 provinces in the country. We have increased the coverage of our barrios where we are operating by 100% in just this past year. Um, in terms of uh, mass campaigns, we have been able to undertake uh, nationally coordinated, sustained, synchronized uh, mass movements. Uh, what we are waging is uh, an armed struggle, a people's war, uh, for national independence, meaning uh, freeing ourselves from the control of U.S. imperialism. States has several military bases in the Philippines. President Marcos gave them unhampered control over those bases in exchange for $500 million in military aid. This is Subic Naval Base, which is of immense strategic importance to the United States. It has the most sophisticated communications system in Asia, 
and is the hub of operations for the U.S. 7th Fleet. We believe it is also their main storage place for nuclear weapons in Asia. Many of us object to the American military presence. We see it as exposing us to nuclear attack, as limiting our national sovereignty, and as a symbol of support for a government flagrantly violating human rights. We also see the twisted values it has introduced into some of our people. American officials and Mr. Marcos speak highly of the ties of friendship between the United States and the Philippines. But when we see towns like this one, converted into rest and recreation centers to cater to the whims of U.S. sailors, can we help asking, is this what one does to a friend? Well, you've seen something of my country and its problems and how my people are trying to solve them. Many of these problems we've inherited from our colonial past, but they've been aggravated by the repressiveness of government and its extravagance and distorted priorities. How can such a government stay in power? Because powerful nations, principally the United States, support it. And they support it because of my country's strategic location and the profits that their multinationals make here. It looks impossible for my people and people of the third world to get out of this trap, but we will. It would be a lot easier if you of the first world were to give us your sympathy and your understanding and prevail upon your governments to stop supporting repressive governments like the one in my country. But whether your governments do or not, I know my people. I know other third world people. I've worked with them. I've lived among them. And whatever your governments do, whatever our own elites and our own rulers do, and even if we have to wade through blood and fire, we will be free. We will develop. We will build our own societies. We will sing our own songs. Thank you. 